At the height of the Cold War, when east-west tensions were at their greatest, Swedish JA-37 Jack Vigen, or Fighter Vigen, fighter pilots were scrambled on 400 to 500 Live Quick Reaction Alert QRA, missions per year to intercept any unidentified aircraft approaching Swedish airspace. QRA targets came from both Warsaw and NATO nations, and were usually flying close to Swedish airspace over the Baltic Sea or the Gulf of Bothnia. No doubt the most challenging QRA targets were the US Air Force's Lockheed SR-71S, that often passed very close to Swedish airspace on their regular Baltic Express missions. The SR-71's awesome performance capabilities provided a unique opportunity for Swedish fighter controllers and JA-37 fighter pilots to evaluate various intercept solutions against a high-speed, high-altitude threat, as Rolf Jonsson, a retired Swedish Air Force, Svenska Flag Vapnet, fighter controller recalls in Paul F. Crickmore book Lockheed Blackbird, Beyond the Secret Missions, the most spectacular alerts in the Swedish Air Force during the 80s occurred about once a week, when the Blackbird was operating in the Baltic. These were also probably the most frustrating events of the entire Cold War, with our fighters trying to reach the same altitude and position as this high-speed, high-altitude target, efforts which, if successful, would allow the fortunate pilot to catch a brief glimpse of the fantastic SR-71 at quite close quarters. When the SR-71 first began operating in Europe our Air Force was equipped with the Saab J-35F Draken and although intercept attempts were made, the aircraft's performance wasn't up to the task. However, one point was clear. The method that offered the greatest opportunity of success was a frontal attack, with both aircraft exactly on a 180 degrees divergent heading, always assuming of course that the SR-71 didn't turn. Other very important factors to try to determine when planning an intercept were the high altitude air temperature and the SR-71 altitude. When the Saab JA-37 Vigen entered service, suddenly the mix was right. The aircraft's performance and avionics capabilities combined with the eagerness of its pilots and a high degree of teamwork with the air command and control centers, including the radar tracker, a conscript, the intercept controller and the pilots. For everything to work, the pilot needed to reach the speed and altitude that corresponded with information derived from the data tracker system in the air operator center. This data determined exactly where and when the pilot needed to initiate a pull-up from cruising altitude to acquire a radar contact. If the pilot failed to lock his radar on first time that was it, the opportunity was gone. At least for another week. On some occasions our pilots had problems locking on because the SR-71 crew activated their defensive countermeasures systems, but pilots soon learned how to avoid triggering such systems. Also, an electronic counter-countermeasures system was built into the JA-37. Another high-performance aircraft operating from bases around the Baltic was the MiG-25 Foxbat. This has a speed advantage on the JA-37 Vigen, but the latter had a superior weapon system and, from 1981, was already using an information dissemination system similar to the Joint Tactical Information Distribution System the US deployed later on tactical aircraft including the F-15 Eagle. The most difficult phase on the intercept for pilots was during the steep climb, since they had to monitor their engine instruments to ensure they remained within the Volvo Flag Motor RM8B turbofan ZGT limits, and also scan their radar screens. During this phase the pilot tilted his radar scan angle down, on its maximum of minus 15 degrees. The radar then had just a few seconds to locate and then lock onto the target before the two aircraft passed one another with a combined speed closing speed of Mach 5, it was an extremely impressive spectacle to watch on radar from the ground. The intercept window was incredibly tight, and all the SR-71 pilot needed to do during the fighter's final climb phase was maneuver just slightly and the intercept solution changed and failed. One of the main problems facing our Vigen pilots was that one of the rules in their orders for safe flight stipulated that flight above 16,000 meters was prohibited without the use of a full pressure suit and these weren't available, so our pilots needed to be careful or they would be grounded by their divisional commanders. The SR-71 Baltic Express flights were usually known about an hour before the aircraft entered the area. The Blackbird always entered the Baltic Sea over a reporting point named Koten, located about 80 kilometers south of Copenhagen and on a heading of about 090 degrees. This usually triggered a scramble by a pair of JA 37s that were kept on alert at either F-10 Angel, F-17 Ronneby or F-13 Norksping, although sometimes even temporary bases like Visby were used. The best base for an SR-71 intercept however, was F-17 Ronneby, because this was best positioned for the acceleration and climb phase, about 30 to 50 kilometers southeast of Gotland and Oland. The SR-71 Baltic flight path remained the same throughout the time it operated in Europe and consisted of a singe anti-clockwise loop that took about 30 minutes to complete. 
It remained in international airspace and first flew off the Polish coast, then just before the Bay of Gdansk, well inside the Kaliningrad enclave, the aircraft muted turned left, onto a heading of about 015 degrees. With the Blackbird now flying at 21 to 24.000 meters only the Su-15 Flagons based at Vaynod, in Latvia, had a chance of making an intercept, and it's doubtful that any of them were actually successful. Certainly the MiG-21 Fishbeds and MiG-23 Floggers based at Pamu, Hopslu and Tapa in Estonia had no chance, their trails on our radar screens in Sweden were so harmless it was painful to witness. The SR-71 then proceeded to a point about 60 kilometers west of the Estonian island of Zarma, where it began a long, programmed left turn, taking it onto a southerly heading of about 190 degrees, rolling southeast of Stockholm. It then passed between the islands of Gotland and Oland, and this always impressed us because the quarter of international airspace between the two islands is only 3 kilometers wide. The Blackbird only violated our airspace once, this was the only time that it became necessary for the Swedish Foreign Department to protest about an airspace violation, when an SR-71 was forced to interrupt its high-speed left turn, reduce speed and descent from its position in the north of its route due to an in-flight emergency. On that occasion, the SR-71 was forced to fly directly over Gotland. At this point AJ-37 strike Fijian pilots took handheld photos of the Blackbird and it is clear to see from these that the aircraft was flying on one engine. It was in this area that our JA-37 pilots carried out their practice intercepts. Once 56 to 74 kilometers southeast of Gotland and Oland, the Baltic Express turned onto a heading of about 265 degrees and exited the area over the same point that it had entered. Almost every time the SR-71 was about to leave the Baltic, a lone MiG-25 Foxbat belonging to the 787th IAP at Finau Eberwalde in the German Democratic Republic was scrambled. Arriving at its exit point, the Baltic Express was flying at about 22 km and the lone MiG would reach about 19 km in a left turn before rolling out and always completing its stern attack 3 km behind its target. We were always impressed by this precision, it was always 22 km and 3 km behind the SR-71. This is interesting, since US Air Force intelligence specialists and SR-71 crew members believed that the only possibility of an interceptor successful engaging a Blackbird would be head-on a position given further credence by the fact that the DEF systems designed to tackle an airborne threat operating within the X-band was forward-facing. When the SR-71 detachment at Mildel Hall was deactivated, the 787th IAP re-equipped with new MiG-29 Fulcrum, but even after the withdrawal, we believe that at least three Foxbats remain behind at Finau Abersfalda, just in case the Baltic Express returned. According to Crickmore, the key to JA-37 successes was the integration of a highly sophisticated data link, which, until relatively recently, remained highly classified. The Swedish Air Force gained significant expertise in the data link field with a system installed in the J-35F back in the 1956. However, the system installed in the JA-37 was far more capable than that of the Draken. It entered service in 1982 and it had the capability to upload and download data to four active aircraft of the same link, it was also capable of downlinking data from an airborne JA-37 to others still on the ground. Data link information was displayed on the horizontal situation display, HSD, and a tactical display, the latter using link symbology that could be overlaid with an electronic map on a multifunction display, MFD. As an integral part of the Strill-60 command and control system that was built around it, the JA-37 could take off, attack, land refuel and rearm, then re-engage, with little or no voice communication, while enduring heavy jamming. As told by Crickmore, the first successful intercept of an SR-71 over the Baltic was carried out by Perot Lawfeld, who recalls the incident, in the 1980, I joined the 2nd Squadron Blue Marlins of Fighter Wing 13, equipped with the JA-37 Fighter Vigian and based at Bravala, just outside the town of Norksping, on the Baltic coast. Our mission was to conduct operational task and evaluation focused on air defense and air superiority. We were already equipped with a data link from the air defense network, the next step was to establish it between fighters and we achieved this in 1981. Integrating this with the PS-46 air-to-air pulse Doppler radar in the Skyflash missile provided the JA-37 with a significant enhanced capability. Looking at the map display on the MFD, the pilot could see other friendlies, the enemy, SAM sites, etc., and this information was constantly updated via the data link by fighter controllers and other JAW-37s, giving the pilot unprecedented levels of situational awareness. In fact, the system was so good that we could employ the same tactics, line abreast, box formations or scissors maneuvers, day or night in VFR or IFR, 
visual flight rules or instrument flight rules. When I conducted the first Swedish Air Force intercept of an SR-71, the target had completed its northbound pass of the Soviet coastline, and had turned west, south of the Finnish island of Åland, and was tracking south of a heading that would take it between Gotland and Åland. The data link from the fighter controller was on, and I lined up for a head-on attack with a target angle of 180 degrees. From my altitude of 8.000 meters I accelerated to Mach 1.35 then pulled up, very gently, continuing to accelerate to between Mach 1.7 and Mach 2.0, topping out at between 18.500 and 20.000 meters. All the target data was on my map display, including radar detection of the target at maximum range, which then locked on immediately afterwards. I simulated missile launches, the closing velocity was very high. Between Mach 4.5 and 5.0, the SR-71 was flying at Mach 2.98 and 21.500 meters. I had visual contact. In total I have 5 hot intercepts against the SR-71 to my credit. All can be described as successful. I was visual 3 times, on a couple of occasions the SR-71 was controlling, which was very useful because you could do a visual check to ensure you ended up in the right spot. When we began conducting these SR-71 intercepts, the squadron began a special air safety program and we all underwent an intense series of emergency procedure checks in the simulator, because we were flying at the outer edges of the envelope and at higher risk. On January 1986, while leading a JA-37-3 ship in aircraft tail number 38, we received target data immediately after takeoff from Bravala. We flew in trail, receiving updated target information over the link from both the fighter controller and the other fighters in the formation. All three of us carried out successful intercepts between 13-14 hours and 13-25 hours, about 50 kilometers west of the town of Visby, on the island of Gotland. Major Muller was number 2, in tail number 60, and Captain Ulf Johansson number 3 in tail number 53. I remember that the SR-71 was flying at an altitude of 22.000 meters and a speed of Mach 2.9. Ulf had some difficulties coming back to Earth, he actually reached the target's altitude and passed the SR-71 head-on at the same altitude with some side separation, but suffered a high temperature engine stall. A cartoon drawn by SAS Captain Stefan Lofren to commemorate this event was used as a poster in our briefing room.